Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Meg. I'm an alcoholic. Hey. Hello. And uh, tonight we're going to be doing the fourth and fifth step, and... Uh, before we go ahead and start, it's going to be kind of anticlimactic. A lot of people think that, you know, four-step is just like, <gasps> four-step. It's really not like that at all. Um, it's not as scary as it's made out to be. It's not as, you know, it, you're not going to want to jump off a cliff. It's not going to be, like, super depressing. At least in my experience, it's not. Um, you know, the one thing that I came out of my four-step with, besides, you know, a deeper connection with my God and an understanding of my own pa- patterns and alcoholism um, was, you know, a connection with my sponsor through the fifth step because my, four, the way I do my fourth and fifth step is, uh, the way my sponsor does hers. And it's kind of in combination. We do four and five together. There are three separate inventories. You do the first inventory, fifth step on the first inventory, fourth step on the second inventory, fifth step on the second inventory, and it goes on like that. So it's done in combination. We cease going through the book at that point. We we don't go any further in the book until we finish the fourth and fifth step. It's kind of important that we don't move forward and we stick to where we're at. So I'm going to kind of take you through it like uh, the way I take a sponsee through. And uh, <clears throat> right after, it starts right after the third step. It says on page 63, it talks about next we launched out on a course of vigorous action. And that's that's immediately following the third step. That's not, you know, take your time, absorb the third step, you know, get comfortable with it, work on three, and then maybe in like two years work on a four step that will take you five years. This is not a very long process. It does it's it's all up basically you meet your sponsee at their level. Um I usually give uh, as I was given, two weeks for each inventory. Um, some people need less. Some people need more. It all depends on the person. So um, step forward. Therefore, we started on a, upon a personal inventory. This was step four on 64 first full par- paragraph. A business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. Taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding and fact-facing process. It is an effort to discover the truth about the stock and trade. One object is to disclose damaged or unsaleable goods, to get rid of them promptly and without regret. If the owner of the business is to be successful, he cannot fool himself about values. We did exactly the same thing with our lives. So we're taking stock of our lives. We're taking a look at our behavior, about um, you know our, the way we feel, the way we feel, our fears, our harms, our sexual behavior, and we're putting it all on paper. And we're taking stock of it. We're taking an honest look at it, uh, uh, almost unemotional look at it in black and white, changing that perspective once again that comes with the third step. Um, First, we searched out the flaws in our makeup which caused our failure, being convinced that self manifested in various ways, selfish, self-centered, self-seeking, was what had defeated us. We considered it common manifestations. Resentment, inventory one, is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else, which is, you know, quite a thing to say because, you know, alcohol destroys alcoholics too, and to say that, you know, resentment destroys more alcoholics than anything else will give you a clue on exactly how powerful this tiny little, um, uh, seemingly tiny little thing can be. Um, from it stems all forms of spiritual disease, for we have not only been mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick, and that's part of the spiritual malady. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. In dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. We listed people, institutions, or principles with whom we were angry. We asked ourselves why we were angry. In most cases, we found that it was our self-esteem, our pocketbooks, our ambitions, our personal relationships, including sex, were hurt or threatened. So we were sore. We were burned up. On our grudge list, we set opposite each name, Each name, our injuries, was it self-esteem, our security, our ambitions, our personal, or sex relations, which had been interfered with. We were usually as definite as this example. Now, if you take a look at the the sheets that were passed out, this is the resentment inventory. Now, it breaks it out a little bit further along than the the three columns. It's a nine-column inventory, 
And what it does is it, it pulls out where was I dishonest. It pulls out where I was frightened. It doesn't just stop there. So it's, it's really important to see where in the process what my patterns are, what, you know, my sponsee's patterns are with dishonesty, with being frightened. Um, where was I to blame? Where was I at fault? And how do I set these matters straight? So how do I set these matters straight ends up right on your A step. We're going to pull a whole bunch out of this four step. So it's kind of important that we don't burn it or, you know, throw it away or put it in a God box. We do a lot of, of work from this inventory as we go through. Um, for example, Mr. Brown, his attention to my wife affects my sex relations, self-esteem. Now, what I usually have um, my sponsees do and what I did was that you put each, each letter down and you explain each one. It's not just it does affect my. It's how does it affect my. Um, I don't think it's important that necessarily I need to be able to read it to understand it because a lot of people are like, I can't write that much. That's a lot. It's just important that uh, if I'm writing the fourth step that I can understand what it means in, you know, a month or two that I can look at it and say like, oh, that's how it affected my self-esteem. This is a pattern of mine. This is something that, you know, affects me in that way. Um, same thing goes with selfish, self-centered, and self-seeking. Now, those are three different definitions. We were having a little bit of a, a juggling before this because uh, they're very similar and they're easily confused. Um, selfish is I want what I want when I want it. Self-centered is it's all about me. The other person's feelings aren't considered. And self-seeking is what can I get out of it. So those are three completely different things, and I'll tell you, they're almost always at play in every resentment, at least in my experience, every one of those. And how is that at play? Because we all know we're always selfish, self-centered, and self-seeking when it comes to resentment. How are we that way? Where was I dishonest? And that's almost always there, whether it be I find a lot, um, I wasn't honest with my feelings, I wasn't being myself. That's another one. Um, where was I frightened? Depending on the resentment, it's, it's pretty simple. I was afraid I was going to be hurt 90% of the time. I was afraid that uh, I was going to be alone or I was afraid somebody wasn't going to love me. Um, where was I to blame? What did I do to damage the relationship? And this will go through, um, and this is, this is, you know, who, who was affected by this? You know, like a resentment against my mother affects my father, affects my brother, affects myself, affects, you know, infinite numbers of people because it's not just me and the person involved that are affected my, by my resentment. It's, it's everybody. It, it's everybody that's touched by that relationship. And it's kind of important to see where that damage goes. You know, that damage can be limitless, especially in close familial relationships. Um, where was I at fault? What were my character defects? I like to use um, the seven deadly sins as a base. They're a lot easier. I just use that as a basis because it's, it, it gives you little categories, and I'm not so good at necessarily identifying or putting words to resentments when I'm in the middle of it. It becomes a little bit more difficult for me. So as a base, I use that. If I need to go outside of it, I do, but I explain each one. It's important that each one, I say how. It's like I'm not just prideful. How was I prideful? How did that, how, how did that affect pride? Um, how do I set these matters straight? Now, this is where you're going to end up on your A step. All right. We're going to jump down. We're not going to go through all the examples in, uh, on 65. We went back through our lives. Nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. Now, I can tell you from the beginning of going through these, if I wasn't completely, I mean, now, this happens every time, and it, I scare sponsees with this, because I went through my four-step, and I was, you know, I was insane. When I went through my first four-step, I was crazy. I thought, like, you know, I was compelled, you know. I was at that point where I was like, I'm going to die. If I do anything even slightly halfway, I'm going to die. Half measures avail me nothing, nothing, nothing. And I went through. And still, yet at the end of that, when I was doing my fifth step, there was two things I left off. Always. And you seem like a psychic. Because you're like, okay, so what didn't you put down? And I was at, at that point, I was compelled, and I thought my sponsor was a psychic. She's like, okay, what didn't you put on there that you're ashamed of or that you're embarrassed about? And that's where it became really important that I was working with a female on this stuff because you know what? There are things I'm just not going to tell men. 
and it's just how it is, you know, and, and it's imperative that I do a fourth and fifth step with, with a woman as a woman. Um, so those two things invariably end up creating a lot of relief, you know, or whatever those things are, but they're always two and nobody's ever alone. And there's, there may be more depending on the person and how, uh, you know, withholding they are, but what really comes out of that is the thoroughness and honesty is so absolutely necessary in order for this process to work. If we pull back, if we hold back and we don't take that honest look at ourselves, it's not, it's going to follow through in the rest of our step work. It's going to follow through because we're not going to be, our sixth step is not going to be accurate. We're not going to be pulling at accurate character defects because we weren't thorough and honest. Same thing with seventh step. You know, you can't relieve something that you haven't been honest about. That's, that's not down there. Same thing with eight and nine. And, and then after nine, I mean, what are you going to do? Because you, you've been halfway, you've been going through this halfway. You haven't been completely honest and thorough. So the effectiveness of the fourth and fifth step is proportional to the amount of honesty and thoroughness that you put into it. Directly proportional. Okay. When we were finished, we considered it carefully. The first thing apparent was that this world and its people were often quite wrong. To conclude that others were wrong was as far as most of us ever got. The usual outcome was that people continued to wrong us and we stayed sore. Sometimes it was remorse and then we were sore at ourselves. But the more we fought and tried to have our own way, the worse matters got. As in war, the victor only seemed to win. Our moments of triumph were short-lived. And that's where we, when we go through, the, the funniest thing I realized in going through my first war step was like, wow, yeah, all of these huge resentments were all me. Turning around and being like, I totally, I either placed myself in the position to be hurt, or, you know, I, I created this situation to create drama. I was always had a hand in it. I was never innocent, except in matters, actually, except in matters of rape and molestation, which do not belong on a four step at all. They don't go there at all. I've had a lot of sponsees try to, try to, bring that guilt onto a four step and say, you know, I was, I shouldn't have been drunk. You know, it was my fault because I was drunk and to go through a four step with something like that can be seriously damaging. So that has no business here and has business in the professional psychological community and we don't even touch it. Um, so going through and finding out that I was literally the cause of all of this was ridiculous because I had these huge resentments, you know, against my mother. She was so controlling. She was this horrible person. And to turn around and find out, be like, right, what would you do if you loved your daughter and she was, you know, drinking and driving cars and, and, you know, disappearing for weeks on end, you know, I placed myself in that position. I knew the consequences of my behavior and I did it anyway. I was like, oh, whoops. I thought it was hysterical. I kept going through this and being like, wow, once again, my fault. Look at that. What should I have done instead? <laughs> Another race step. Um, all right, so moving on. And it is plain that a life which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. To the precise extent that we permit these do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile. But with the alcoholic, whose hope is the maintenance and growth of his spiritual experience, this business of resentment is infinitely grave. We found that it is fatal. From when harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunshine of, sunlight of the spirit. The insanity of alcohol returns, and we drink again. And with us, to drink is to die. And in, like, no uncertain terms, this is where it was translated to me. Like, I am not, if I'm resentful, I am cut off from God. And this includes, I mean, I was used to, I was really impressed when I went through the first time. I mean, because the guys went through and did one style of four-step, and then the girls went through and did this style of four-step. And I remembered the guys going through and be like, red lights. I am resentful at red lights. And I was like, whoa, now that is seriously thorough. You know, like, <laughs> uh, Wow. You know, I didn't even consider that. I was amazed, you know, and they had this whole, like, system of checks and graphs and, like, they all had binders like this, man. It was amazing. But we were going through this, and I was like, okay. Um, a lot of the things that I had on there were institutions. You know, I had resentments against Saturn, uh, the car company, because my car was falling apart. Yeah, of course, it's the big car company's fault. Not my fault that I decided to pull, like, tow trucks with my little SC2. Yeah, good times. 
Um, I had resentments against the Catholic Church, and this was a big one that I figured out that was a real release to my spiritual recovery. Um, I realized that my resentment against the Catholic Church had absolutely nothing to do with God, had everything to do with me being selfish and condemning an entire spiritual movement based on the behavior of one or two people that f- happened to, to buy into that. Like, wow, I just condemned, wholesale, condemned an entire religion. Or even, I mean, Christianity, not even just Catholicism. Um, And this is where I was able to get some more perspective on it. You know, uh, holy rolling Christian ideology was, I believe, my phrasing on my fourth step. And uh, coming out of it, everybody's allowed to have their own perspective. You know, and it's just... That's all it is. I'm allowed to have my God. You're allowed to have your God. And that's how it works. Okay. So when we are in resentment, we are blocked from God. And that is an absolute as it goes through with, you know, so many other things in this book. When I'm slightly resentful, that means I'm being selfish, self-centered, and self-seeking, which means I'm not God-centered, which means I'm self-centered. We cannot be self-centered and God-centered at the same time. It is impossible. They cannot coexist within one person. I either am or I am not. So this is how resentment kills. This is how resentment is the number one offender. If we were to live, we had to be free of anger. The grouch and the brainstorm were not for us. They may be the dubious luxury of normal men, but for alcoholics, these things are poison and run into this in the office all the time. Beep, 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 along with gossip, you know. Beep, 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 so-and-so. Is ba, 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 ba. These are the dubious luxuries of other men, but not so for me. I can't afford to have that resentment. I can't afford to engage in that gossip. We turned back to the list, for it held the key to the future. We were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. We began to see that the world and its people, the world and its people really do- dominated us. In that state, the wrongdoing of others, fancied or real, which, you know, we make up stuff in our head. It becomes apparent, very, very clear when we go through this, um, had the power to actually kill. How could we escape? We saw that these resentments must be mastered, but how? We could not wish them... An- away any more than alcohol. So just saying, you know, okay, so I'm just not going to be resentful doesn't work. We have to take some more action on it. This was our course. We realized that the people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick, and this is the change in, the, in perspective that is necessary. This is where, you know, the psychic change starts to appear, and we start to get that change in our perspective that's God-given. Um, we realized that the people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick that we did not like their symptoms and the way these disturbed us, they, like ourselves, were sick too. Resentment prayer. We asked God to help, help us show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience that we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. When the person offended, we said to ourselves, This is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? God, save me from being angry. Thy will be done. So there is a prayer for, for resentment. This is our resentment prayer. We avoid retaliation or argument. So that's like a huge deal for me because I'm a big debater. I'm huge. And this is where it's telling me I don't argue. And this is where I learn to end the conversation. You know, I'm not going to explain my, I don't need to explain myself. I'm not going to debate with you. Conversation's over, which was a big thing I reiterated over and over and over again as I took this message out into the world. Well, as I took this message out into other meetings, because it's, you may find, I don't know how active other people are in other meetings in the area, there's a great deal of um, people aren't sometimes necessarily open to this path we have before us. And a lot of times they enjoy to challenge, you know, um, and instead of engaging in that and being a bad example, I choose to step down and not argue. I'm not going to argue about my program. This is my experience. This conversation is over. It's extraordinarily difficult. It's very difficult because we're fighters. I mean, come on. It's like, oh, yeah, you want to throw down? I got a big book. What's up now? You know, (laughs) but this is where we cease. We cease fighting. You know, I'm not going to fight with you. Either you're drawn to this or you're not. It's another part of bringing this message to other people. Um, We wouldn't treat sick people that way. 
<laughs> if we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. We cannot be helpful to all people, but at least God will show us how to, how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. So if it's not their time, it's not their time. If it is, it is. God's will. Referring to our list again, putting out of our minds the wrongs others had done, we resolutely looked for our own mistakes. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened, hence the other columns. Though a situation had not, had not been entirely our fault, we tried to disregard the other person involved entirely. Where were we to blame? And the funny thing is, when I first did this, I wrote down the column headings wrong with my sponsor. And it was, um, where were they to blame, column seven? <laughs> Oh, yeah. She's like, right, we're going to redo that. And that's that's where I learned it's a very active fourth and fifth step at the same time, you know, because when that happened, my sponsor sat down with me, and as we went through each resentment, she said, okay, now where were you to blame? And I wrote, and we did the fourth and fifth step at the same time. When there are blanks, and there will be blanks, you know, there will be times where it's like, I can't figure out where I was dishonest. I don't understand how I was dishonest. I can't get it where my sponsor helped me to find that. They're like, well, do you think that this may have been dishonest? Oh, right, okay. So it's going to happen. They're going to be blanks, and that's the, the purpose of going through. So that's the purpose of a fifth step, the guidance. Um, though a situation had not been entirely our fault, we tried to disregard blah, 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 blah. Where were we to blame? The inventory was ours, not the other man's. When we saw our faults, we listed them. We placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our we admitted our wrongs honestly and were willing to set these matters straight. Notice that the word fear is bracketed alongside the difficulties with Mr. Brown, Miss Jones, the employer, and the wife. This short word somehow touches about every aspect of our lives. It was an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. It set in motions in motion trains of circumstances which brought us mis misfortune we felt we didn't deserve. But did not we ourselves set the ball rolling? Sometimes we think fear ought to be classed with stealing. It seems to cause more trouble. And the more you take a look at your fear inventory, the more you realize, wow, just about everything in my life. Um, we reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper. Even though we had no resentment in connection with them, we asked ourselves why we had them. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Self-reliance was good as far as it went, but it didn't go so far enough. Some of us... Some of us once had great self-confidence, but it didn't fully solve the fear problem or any other. When it made us cocky, it was worse. Okay, so that's the fear inventory. This is where a lot of people get confused. And the second page is the fear inventory. And what we're gonna, what it goes through is what is this fear? You pick a fear, general fear. You know you're going to know what they are. And basically what eventually happens is that these fears all get classed into big categories. You know, you'll figure out, like, well, oh, that's the same fear as this. It all, it, it, they get lumped into, like, I'm afraid I'm not going to be loved. I'm afraid they get lumped into huge categories. So we'll go through one of these. Um, what is the fear? Abandonment. Cause. When was the first time this was felt? And I call these photographs pictures. There are always pictures in your mind of moments in time. That moment that you connect with that first fear, it's usually in early childhood, somewhere between, you know, early childhood and early adolescence where this occurs. And you get, a, you get a picture in time, that moment, that moment where I was, you know, playing in the racks at the department store and I came out and I couldn't find my mom. Snap. And that's, I have that moment. I have that fear in my head. And that was the first time I felt it. So my mother lost me in a store. What conditions arose? What behaviors did I adopt to avoid feeling this response to fear? Distrust of authority of women or women. Learn to trust myself only. Have negative feelings that good relationship will turn sour. How does that reflect in my life? You know, if we carry that through, if I carry that emotion through, wow, I can't trust anybody. My mom disappeared. I can't trust anybody, especially women. She failed me. You know, um, if I can't trust my mother, I can't trust anybody. If I can't trust women, I can't, it, it blankets. And you start to see how these tiny, my, cause my mother lost me in a store. I will forever not trust the authority of, or women. I, for the rest of my life, you start to look at these and be like, oh my God, 
<laughs> what is wrong with me? These tiny little instances cause these huge changes in the way I perceive the world. And then we go to the next one. What's the opposite? Being taken care of. So I'm afraid of somebody taking care of me. Opposite cause. First time this was felt. And there will be another photograph. And this is the crazy thing. When you go through this, it's kind of like, I'm damned if I do, damned if I don't. And you start to realize the idiocy of these fears. They lose their power very quickly because you're like, wow, this is completely useless. You know, my, my, one of my favorite fears is hysterical because my father spanked me once. The one time the man laid a hand on me in my entire life when I was five, when I stole 20 bucks out of my mother's purse, he spanked me once. And forevermore, I will never trust anybody to be there in my life. Wow huge so being taken care of opposite cause parent reminding me of how much he or she does for me makes me feel i only have i have to be only good or i will lose him or her so there's that perfectionism that comes out if i fail nobody will love me um opposite condition i get angry anytime someone tells me what they've done for me when i see it as only their job <laughs> Uh, we're so entitled. Isn't that great? Um, don't take any guff from anyone, but I also don't listen to the criticism or change my behavior to suit anyone's expectations. Very independent. Won't take gifts from others. Don't know how to receive gracefully. Always feel there's a price tag. If somebody asks me to do something, I agree and don't show up. Yeah, good times, good times. Um, the power of the fear inventory, I felt immediately. And going through them. It literally, there was no real explanation for it. As I was going through it, I was relieved of a great number of these fears. I don't know how. I can't explain it. They just lost their power. As they took shine that bright shining light on them, that is the fourth and fifth step, they went away. So, and you know, there are more that will crop up in life, but you know, the first one, it's always a bonus. Um... <clears throat> All right. Perhaps there's a better way. We think so. For we are now on a different basis, the basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We are in the world to play the role he assigns just to the extent that we do as we think he would have us and humbly rely upon him. Does he enable us to match calamity with serenity? That is one of my favorite lines, and I reiterated it constantly in early sobriety. I want to match calamity with serenity. I want to match calamity with serenity, you know, um, and that takes different levels, you know, from blowing out a tire and getting into a car accident and, then, you know, calmly getting out of the car and being like, so be it, to that tiny little thing you wanted to get done at the office that you didn't quite get done, that create that, that you view as calamitous, you're like, well, it didn't get done. You know, there there's a range here, but this is one of my favorite promises. We never apologize to anyone for depending on our creator. We can laugh at those who think spirituality is the way of weakness. Paradoxically, it is the way of strength. The verdict of the ages is that faith means courage. All men of faith have courage. They trust their God. We never apologize for God. Instead, we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. Now, that's also a spot check prayer that I use pretty consistently whenever I find myself in that place of fear. You know, it directs us earlier, um, you know, when we find ourselves in a, in a place of indecision to pause, to take a step back. And that's usually where I add in the fear prayer. You know, God, please remove this fear and direct my attention to what you would have it be. And you'd be amazed at how that how effective that tiny little prayer is. At once, we commence to outgrow this fear. So that's a huge promise. The second we we look that other direction, we at once we commence to outgrow this fear. That's huge. These things that have been haunting us for our entire lives. Now about sex. Many of us needed an overhauling there, but above all, we tried to be sensible on this question. It's so easy to get way off the track. Here we find human opinions running to extremes, absurd extremes perhaps. One set of voices that cry that, cry that sex is a lust of our lower nature, a base necessity of procreation. Then we have the voices who cry for... <laughs> 
who cry for sex and more sex, who bewail the institution of marriage, <clears throat> who think that most of the troubles of the race are traceable to sex causes. They think we do not have enough of it or that it isn't the right kind. They see its significance everywhere. One school would allow a man, allow man no flavor for his fare, and the other would have us all on a straight pepper diet. We want to stay out of this controversy. We do not want to be the arbiter of anybody's sex conduct. We all have sex problems. We'd hardly be human if we didn't. What can we do about them? And that, for me, is about removing the judgment behind anybody's sexual behavior. There's zero judgment placed on that. That was really funny. Um, so that brings us to the sex harms done inventory, which is a combination inventory. Um, we do all harms done others and all of our sexual relationships. Now, what I did on mine, it was a kind of strange combination. I did small paragraphs. I created small paragraphs for each of the sexual relations relationships I had in my life. I also grouped together <laughs> different times in my life. So college men, anything that wasn't a major relationship, you know, um, at home men, Etc. 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 I went through each of the relationships and I detailed the relationship. I wrote, you know, the positives, the negatives, and my behavior just so I had that to go off of. And then I turned to my sex inventory, and I went through where was I selfish, self-centered, self-seeking? Where was I inconsiderate? So we're going to take a look at the breakdown of each of those relationships, um, and also in just general sexual relationships, we're going to look at the breakdown of those because you know. Very rarely was anybody else's feelings considered when I ended up just in bed with somebody. It just didn't happen. I didn't care about you. It was all about me. And that's a real area for a lot of people, especially for women, that's a very big area of shame. So it's extremely important that there's no judgment assigned there. Um, where was I dishonest? I'm always lying, and it's just, you know, another piece of it. Who got hurt? And once again, we will find that it goes out in circles. It expands exponentially. It is not just me that I harm by my behavior. I harm the other people involved. I, I harm my friends. I harm my family in any given situation. It doesn't matter how. Um, where did I arouse jealousy, suspicion, and bitterness? Famous for that in relationships, you know, famous for um, engineering jealousy, suspicion, and bitterness to get what I wanted because I didn't care. Uh, where was I to blame? What were my character defects? Once again, we can pull out of the seven deadly sins to make things easier. If you find you have, you know, another list you want to work off of, or if you do this, you know, better, just picking your own words, that's fine too. And what should I have done instead? This is another eighth step list. So here we, we're going to be building off of this inventory as well. <clears throat> okay. Uh, we're gonna, we go through this with harms as well. This is where we get um, general dishonesty that's not placed on resentment. We get uh, stealing. We get whatever it is, a harm that you've done, any harm that you've done anybody else that doesn't necessarily contain resentment or didn't make it on any other part of the inventory, this is where it goes. Um, I'll go through one with money. Where was I selfish, self-centered, self-seeking? I stole from um, my job. I did this in sobriety, mind you. I stole out of petty cash from my job. Where was I inconsiderate? I didn't consider the company or my place in the company. I didn't consider that I was harming those around me by, by taking money out of the coffers. Where was I dishonest? I lied about it. That was easy. Um, who got hurt? The company got hurt. I got hurt. The employees got hurt. Um, where did I arouse jealousy, suspicion, and bitterness? I aroused suspicion there because I didn't admit to it. I didn't cop to it. And, you know, there was a suspicion all around the company because somebody was taking it, and they didn't know who. Bitterness, my other employees who knew that it was, wasn't them. <laughs> It was me. Um, where was I to blame? What are my character defects? Greed. Um, I'm doing this in my head as we go through right now. Let's see. Let's just go with greed for now. I'm sure there are about five other ones. Greed. I didn't care. I just wanted what I wanted. It's part of my selfishness. I didn't care about how other people 
were going to be affected. I just wanted the money. Could have cared less. It belonged to me. I was entitled to it. They didn't pay me enough. Um, what should I have done instead? How about not stolen? That's always a good plan is not stealing when stealing. Um, and what I have to do here <laughs> is give back the money. Not slip it under the door, not donate it to somebody, not buy a couple big books. I have to go to the company that I stole from and give them the money. <coughs> Another A step. Okay. Um, after we go through the sex inventory, we come to the sexual ideal. This is where those little paragraphs come in really handy. Um, I pulled out of each of those these paragraphs, and I go from my experience, and it's important that I go from my experience, and this builds and grows and changes. This is a living thing. Um, what do I want in a partner? I pulled all of the positives, all the things that I enjoyed out of my past relationships, and I put them down here. Anything now... This is the sneak attack. Anything I wrote in column one must be willing to bring to the relationship. So that's usually a sneak attack, and I don't write that down. I usually have my sponsor. I wasn't told it was a sneak attack for me. So um, my sponsor had me write down, you know, my sexual ideal, and it, it began with, you know, all of these positive relationship characteristics, and then there's a column where you put anything that's unacceptable. What is unacceptable to me? I don't do triangles. That is unacceptable to me. Maybe acceptable to some people, not to me. You know, uh, dishonesty, unacceptable. This is where I establish those boundaries, and this is where I stick to it. It's really keeps you from getting into pretty messed up relationships. Um, and then as they sit there and they read this wonderful thing to you, that's where you say, okay, great, bring it. And they go, what? Everything that you put in that first column, you have to be. You want financial security. You want somebody to take care of you. You need to be able to take care of somebody else. You want to be financially supported. You need to be able to financially support somebody else. You want to be loved. You have to give love. You want to feel appreciated. You want, to, you want romance. You have to bring it. You have to be romantic. So as we go through this, it's an amazing guide. And I'll tell you, man, I didn't have sex for a good two and a half years <laughs> after I wrote my sexual inventory. Um, this, this idea, hey, it's open honesty. <laughs> um, effectively, you know, I went through phases with it. I went through a phase where it was like, you know, this rigidity to, you know, as, you know, it tends to follow us in the first couple of years after doing the book. Um, this rigidity, I, I was like, you have to be perfect man. No flaws. That will keep you out of bed. Um, <laughs> and then you, I went to the other end of the scale. I was like, I quit. I give up. So much for a sexual ideal. It just doesn't exist. There's just never going to be a relationship ever in my life. Um, and then I came back to it, and I realized that there are checks and balances with everything. And that what I put down on my uh, sexual ideal changes and grows as I learn and I experience people. So as I grow and experience people, things get added, things get taken off, and I have to continue to bring that to my, to, <laughs> I hate her. Um, I have to continue to bring that to the table. Okay. In this way, we have tried to shape a sane and sound ideal for a future sex life. We subjected each relation to this test. Was it selfish or not? We asked God to mold our, our ideals and to help us live up to them. We remembered, we remembered always that our sex powers were God-given and therefore good, neither to be used lightly nor selfishly, nor to be despised and loathed. So, I mean, I've had sponsees put down, you know, I'm not looking for a commitment. I don't want commitment. I don't want these specific things that I don't necessarily agree with. But once again, there's that judgment that's removed. There's no room for judgment when doing a fist up. Um, whatever our ideal turns out to be, we must be willing to grow toward it. <laughs> Hence, the rigidity didn't work out too well for me. We must be willing to make amends where we have done harm, providing that we do not bring, bring about still more harm in so doing. In other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem. In meditation, we ask God what we should do about each specific matter. The right answer will come if we want it. God alone can judge our sex situation. Counsel, counsel with persons is often desirable, 
but we will let God be the final judge. We realize that some people are as fanatical about sex as others are loose. We avoid hysterical thinking or advice. Uh, okay, suppose we fall short of the chosen ideal and stumble. Does this mean we're going to get drunk? No. <laughs> um, some people tell us so, but this is only half truth. It depends on us and our motives. If we're sorry for what we have done and we have the honest desire to let God take us to better things, we will believe it be, will be forgiven and we'll have learned our lesson. If we are not sorry, huge. If we are not sorry and our conduct continues to harm others, we're quite sure to drink. We are not theorizing. These are facts out of our experience. So all of this wonderful stuff, this wonderful new awareness we have of our patterns and our behaviors coming out of our fifth step, if we continue to engage in this behavior knowing the damage it causes in the people and the relationships around us, we will drink. Fact. Fact. We continue to harm others. We continue to engage in... <laughs> we continue to engage in self-centered, uh, self-seeking, selfish behavior. We're going to drink. That's just how it is. The second I know that I'm harming somebody else and I continue to engage in that behavior, I am now playing on the fence. Okay. <laughs> um... To sum up about sex, we earnestly pray for the right ideal, for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity, for the strength to do the right thing. If sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves the harder into helping others. We think of their needs and work for them. This takes us out of ourselves. It quiets the imperious urge when to yield would mean heartache. If we have been thorough about our personal inventory, we have written down a lot. We have listed and analyzed our resentments. We have begun to comprehend their futility and their fatality. We have commenced to see their terrible destructiveness. We have begun to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill toward all men, promises, um, even our enemies, for we look on them as sick people. We have listed the people we have hurt by our conduct and are willing to, willing to straight out, straighten out the past if we can. In this book, you read again and again that faith did for us what we could not do for ourselves. We hope you are now convinced that God can remove whatever self-will has blocked you off from him. If you have already made a decision and an inventory of your grosser handicaps, you've made a good beginning. That being, that being so, you've swallowed and digested some big chunks of truth about yourself. Okay, so that's it. Out of coming out of my, uh, my fourth and fifth step, there is an extreme change in my perspective and how I viewed the world. It was radical, and it was not something that I knew was happening nor something that I expected. It was just a result of going through this and really going through this in an extremely rigorous way. Um, that happens every time I witness that with a fourth and fifth step. Um, coming out of this with a new perspective and awareness of, of what my patterns are, what my behaviors are, um, understanding the effect that resentment can have, it changes it changed my perspective on on life in general and that was a huge chunk of the psychic change that they talk about and i only noticed that in retrospect i didn't notice that up front i didn't actually even notice any of those changes until i was at the a step and i was like wow what happened i'd been pickled and that's what i call it i was talking about it last week you become pickled there are things that just never are the same they just never go back you've been pickled i can't go back to being a cucumber i'm done so uh, with that, uh, thanks very much for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.